reading from the Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 10, Chapter 2, Prayers by the Demigods, Text 11 and 12, and I think we have Text 11 on the uh, board here. So, uh, kind of a rare thing today, we're going to be chanting the name Sadurga, Maya. So, but because in the Srimad Bhagavatam, everything is in relationship to Krishna, it is all auspicious. Okay. Namadeyani kurvanti Stanani chanarabhuvi Durgeti badrakali ti Vijaya vaishnavi ticha Text 11 and 12 are actually together here. So the 12 is Kumida chandika krishna mahadavi kanyake ticha Maya narayani shani Lord Krishna blessed Maya Devi by saying, In different places on the surface of the earth, people will give you different names, such as Durga, Bhadrakali, Vijaya, Vaishnavi, Kumuda, Chandika, Krishna, Madhavi, Kanyaka, Maya, Narayani, Ishani, Sharada, and Ambika. Purport by Srila Prabhupada. Yes, Srila Prabhupada. Because Krishna and his energy appeared simultaneously, people have generally formed two groups, the Shaktas and the Vaishnavas, and sometimes there is a rivalry between them. Essentially, those who are interested in material enjoyment are Shaktas, and those who are interested in spiritual salvation and attaining the spiritual kingdom are Vaishnavas. Because people are generally interested in material enjoyment, they are interested in worshiping Maya Devi, the energy of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Vaishnavas, however, are Shuddha Shaktas, or pure Bhaktas, because the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra indicates worship of the Supreme Lord's energy, Hara. A Vaishnav prays to the energy of the Lord for the opportunity to serve the Lord along with his spiritual energy. Thus, Vaishnavas all worship such deities as Radha Krishna, Sita Ram, Lakshman Narayan, Rukmini Dwarkadish, and Radha Kalachanji. I, I just, I made that up. Whereas, Dur <laughs> whereas Durga Shaktas worship the material energy under different names. The names by which Maya Devi is known in different places have been listed by Balabhachadra as follows. In Varanasi, she's known as Durga. In Avanti, she's known as Badrakali. In Orissa, she's known as Vijaya. And in Kulapura, she is known as Vaishnavi or Mahalakshmi. The representatives of Mahalakshmi and Ambika are present in Bombay. In the country known as Kambarupa, she is known as Chandika. In northern India as Sharada and Cape Comoran as Kanyaka. Thus she is distributed according to various names in various places. Srila Vijaya Devaja Tirthapad in his Padma Ratnavala Tika has explained the meanings of the different representations. Maya is known as Durga because she is approached with great difficulty, as Bhadra because she is auspicious, and as Kali because she is deep blue. Because she is the most powerful energy, she is known as Vijaya. Because she is one of the different energies of Vishnu, she is known as Vaishnavi. And because she enjoys in this material world and gives facilities for material enjoyment, she is known as Kumuda. Because she is very severe to her enemies, the Asuras, she is known as Chandika. And because she gives all sorts of material facilities, she is called Krishna. In this way, the material energy is differently named and situated in different places on the surface of the globe. Om Gyana Timrandasya Gyana Jana Sarakaya Chakshun Mitamina Tasma Shri Gravena Maha Vanchikal Patri Bisha Kripisina Bibicha Patitano Bhavana Bio Vaishmi Namona Maha Hare Krishna, so thank you very much for having this opportunity to speak here today. I'm always very uh, very happy to be here in Dallas and see Radhakala Chanji. I had the opportunity to serve here and I can't even remember, 1974, 1975, about 35 years ago. And um, of course, everything is so much nicer here now. Uh, such a beautiful temple and everything is, everything is so nice. And we always enjoy coming here for our meetings and enjoy the association of devotees and the wonderful service that the devotees give to us. So in this particular a series of verses in the second chapter of the 10th canto, the prayers by the demigods, we're starting to hear the story of how Krishna is unfolding his pastimes of his appearance. Here Krishna is ordering Yogamaya uh, to transfer the child uh, in um, 
David Key's womb uh, to um, Rohini, and then also uh, telling Yoga Maya that she will then take, uh, take birth as the daughter of Yashoda. Then, of course, we know they are transferred. Uh, Krishna and Yoga Maya are transferred after, the, after their births. So um, Krishna is sort of elaborating the plot here to, uh, to Yoga Maya about what is going to be happening. And, um, and now, um, in these last couple of verses, um, Krishna is, is giving some assurance to Yoga Maya that her position will be assured, that she'll be very, very glorious, uh, represented in, uh, both in the spiritual and the material worlds. Now, it's interesting, of course, that Yoga Maya we always think of as the internal potency of the Lord. Yoga Maya is sort of that covering potency, but the spiritual potency. Yoga Maya often uh, is very involved in Krishna's pastimes in Vrindavan and executes, helps to execute those pastimes. And to the degree that she, uh, her energy is illusory, it is always for the purpose of increasing the love of the devotees. So sometimes when Mother Yashoda, for instance, when uh, she opened Krishna's mouth and she sees the universal form, and she becomes totally bewildered, then Yoga Maya covers her so that she once again thinks, this is my little baby Krishna and I'm his mother, so that she can enjoy that wonderful Vatsalya Rasa. Now, Yoga Maya then expands, of course, as Mahamaya. And all of these names that we just heard about the different representations, the different uh, names of, uh, of Maya, generally refer to Mahamaya or um, uh, Durga. Uh, as she expands into this material world and represents the material energy. So it's interesting that it's described that uh, Prabhupada says in, in the purport, or in a purport here, that Krishna and Maya appeared simultaneously. You know, in other words, Krishna was born at exactly, almost exactly the same time that Yoga Maya was born, and then, of course, they're switched. So they're born simultaneously. So Prabhupada said because of that, they are both worshipped. They both came into this material, into the appeared in this material world together, and therefore both of them are worshipped. And as has probably described here, there's sometimes a rivalry between the two groups. So generally, we see the two main camps of worshippers are the shaktas and the bhaktas, those who are worshiping Krishna directly, and those who are worshiping the energy of Krishna. Of course, Prabhupada makes a distinction that the devotees also worship the energy of Krishna, but we worship Krishna in the form of the internal energy his personal pleasure potency as Radharani, Rukmini, Lakshmi, etc. So there's a distinction there between worshiping Krishna along with his energy, and Prabhupada said that's represented in the Hare Krishna mantra by the word Hare, which is, of course, the name of the internal energy of Radharani. That's very different than the Shaktas, or those who, those who worship the material manifestation or the material energy of Krishna, worshiping uh, God, Krishna, how he manifests himself within this material world. So generally, the difference is, as been mentioned here, that the devotees of Durga or Shiva, often they are either worshiping uh, Durga or Shiva, they generally are worshiping for some material reward. The purpose of that worship, the purpose of that devotion uh, has, has a reason, has a motive. And that motive is to get some material reward, material satisfaction, perhaps to be elevated to a higher birth or to a higher heavenly planet, or to receive wealth or, uh, or some, something material within this world. Whereas the devotees of Krishna are not interested in worshiping for material gain. We do not approach Krishna, please, uh, please, Lord, uh, you know, fulfill my, all of my material desires, please give me my daily bread, this type of thing. This is not generally the, the prayer and the desire of the devotees. Rather, as Prabhupada said here, the devotees want liberation from this material world, and of course, beyond that, we want ultimately pure devotional service. We just want the opportunity to be able to serve Krishna, and the idea is not to try to enjoy in this material world, but to become released from the clutches of the three modes of material nature, to actually become liberated from Maya, not to serve Maya or to worship Maya, but to become liberated from the influence of Maya so that we can purely worship Krishna and ultimately get out of this material world and go back home, back to Godhead. So, one thing that's, that's uh, rather interesting, uh, the, if we look at the different worshipers of uh, Durga or Shiva and the worshipers of, of Krishna, we see a very, different, uh, a very different situation. 
And in fact, this is uh, described in the um, 10th Canto and the 88th chapter. It's a very interesting discussion there. And uh, Maharaj Parikit asks Shukadeva Goswami, he says, why is it that Shiva, who is very renounced, you know, who is just seen in matted locks and covered with ashes and very ascetic, very renounced, his followers are very wealthy. Those who worship him gain material reward. But Krishna, Vishnu, Narayan, is very wealthy. He's full of all six opulences. We see his incredible pastimes of opulence that he displays, but yet his followers, his bhaktas are often very poor. So how do we understand this? So Shukadeva Goswami appreciated such a good question by Maharaj Parikit, and he referred to him to a, as often happens in the Bhagavatam, well, this is like, reminds me of a past situation, another story when actually uh, Krishna directly um, instructed Yudhishthir on the same matter. So um, one of the, um, uh, probably the, the best known verses, which has a wonderful purport to it, is 10.88.8, uh, which says, the personnel of God had said, if I especially favor someone, I gradually deprive him of his wealth. Then his relatives and friends of such a poverty-stricken man abandon him. In this way, he suffers one distress after another. Well, that doesn't sound like a very good deal, does it? You know, they worship Krishna, and you're going to get a, everyone's going to abandon you. All your friends will uh, uh, will dislike you. Your relatives will think this person is worthless because Krishna's taken away all of his wealth. Of course, then he goes on to describe that because of this. Because Krishna will put his devotee in an impoverished situation, he's forced to surrender and give up his material attachments. Some of us have experienced this. So uh, this often happens with devotees, that uh, we're put into situations of material distress or any material wealth we have may be taken away, uh, etc. And because of that, the devotee is forced to rely upon Krishna and give up those material attachments. The devotee understands, at least we try to understand, why this is happening. Why the devotee will sometimes experience distress or experience suffering. Um, there's a, um, in the, the purport to 1088 is a very, very wonderful purport. Uh, the, um, the Bhaktivedanta Book Trust edition and the, and the explanation of Srila Prabhupada in the Krishna book are both uh, almost word-for-word word pattern after the uh, commentary of Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur. So that's, uh, in fact, the, in, the, uh, in, our, uh, in our 10th canto, it's almost word-for-word, 95% word, of it, several pages. The purport is, 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 is directly from, from uh, Vishwanath's commentary because it's very, very wonderful, very powerful. Of course, I recommend everybody should read that. But what Vishwanath uh, explains to us is that devotees will often experience a, some distress or some loss of wealth. Uh, they may become abandoned by their relatives or they may experience in different ways. The first thing to understand is that it is not a result of karma. The devotee does not experience distress like an ordinary non-devotee who suffers and enjoys because of uh, reactions to one's past activities. Krishna relieves the devotee of their, of their past karma. So it is not under the same rules. It's under sort of a different, it's a different system. You know, Krishna karma is, is different than ordinary karma. But we still may, uh, may experience some incidental effects of karma due to our past activities. So while we know that devotional service has the power to destroy the effects of karma, we still experience what is described as a residual effect. Um, now, first of all, that residual effect that we experience is greatly minimized. Uh, Vishwanath explains that you know, it's, a, it's a very minimal reaction that the devotee actually experiences compared to probably the uh, mass of sinful activities and potential reactions that we might experience. Srila Prabhupada also explained this. He described this. He, once he said, the knife, that, the knife that cuts you in the kitchen was meant to kill you. He gave that as an example of how karma is greatly mitigated for the devotee. So sometimes we think, oh, I'm suffering so much. Uh, we have no idea how much probably we should be suffering or you know, what, what reactions we, we might have, but Krishna very kindly relieves those. And we have to understand that, um, you know, that, it, that it, is, it, is, it is a process of winding down. 
So while we are not creating, as long as one is under the internal potency, which means basically following the instructions of the spiritual master, chanting one's rounds, following the principles, etc., one is under the internal potency and is not creating new karma. And in fact, in the all past karmic reactions are being, are being dissipated, are being taken care of. But Prabhupada gives example, which we've all heard of, of uh, there's, a, there's a fan going around, you pull the plug, and so it's gradually winding down. It's, there's no new energy being put into that fan. So in other words, no karma is, is continuing to be created, but as it winds down, we may still experience some of those effects. And in fact, in the uh, Bhakti Samrita Sindhu, there's a description of the different type of karmic reactions. There's, there's three or four different ones. Those are in seed, et cetera. Uh, there's, a, there's an elaborate description. And we can understand that some of those we can't do a lot about. For instance, we're born in a particular body. Now, no matter, I'm, if, even if I were a pure devotee, I'm still going to have this body and it might have certain, you know, experiences and we may experience a certain amount of pain or suffering just because of the body that I received due to my past activities. So there's some things that we can't completely eliminate any suffering that's uh, associated with that body. But, uh, but there still is this winding down effect. Now further, we understand that, um, again, that whatever karmic reactions there are not entangling. They're not leading to further entanglement within the material world. Uh, I was going to read, this is uh, from, from Vishwanath's uh, purport to that verse. He says, although a Vaishnav's happiness and distress are felt as pleasure and pain, just like ordinary karmic reactions, they are different in a significant sense. Material happiness and distress arising from karma leave a subtle residue, and Prabhupada calls that karma pala, the seed of future entanglement. Such enjoyment and suffering tend toward degradation and increase the danger of falling into hellish oblivion. Happiness and distress generated from the Supreme Lord's desires, however, leave no trace after the immediate purpose has been served. Moreover, the Vaishnav who enjoys such reciprocation with the Lord is in no danger of falling down into nescience. So what he's basically saying is that whatever reaction is there, Krishna is handling personally and directly for the benefit of the devotee. It will not be further entangling for us. It will not create the cycle of further reaction and further suffering in the material world. Rather, it will be liberating. And, it's, and as described here, there is no need for that reaction to continue once its purpose is being served. So what is that purpose that's being served? Why does Krishna even need to put his devotees in distress? Well, first of all, the devotee understands that everything is coming from the Lord. Whatever I experience, whatever is happening to me is directly Krishna's mercy. So all good or bad conditions that I find myself in are Krishna's special mercy to me. They're an opportunity for learning. They're an opportunity for growth. They're an opportunity for surrender. Krishna gives us these opportunities to advance in Krishna consciousness. Now, why doesn't he just give us all good experiences? Why doesn't he give us just wonderful, happy experiences, um, you know, so that we'll just become enlivened in Krishna consciousness because it's so wonderful and I just get all good things? Well, unfortunately, it doesn't quite work that way. And our psychology doesn't quite work that way. Sometimes we have to experience suffering to learn. We don't always learn just by everything being good. Witness the demigods. Right? At least those that are on the level of Indra and the Svargaloka planetary system, uh, they're devotees. They're definitely devotees. They are completely they are worshiping Krishna. They understand Krishna. But because they're in a situation where they're basically always enjoying, what's the danger? The danger is they become illusion. And we see so many stories of Indra and the other demigods falling into some sort of forgetfulness or forgetting Krishna's place. And so it, it actually becomes a struggle. It actually can become more difficult to be Krishna conscious if everything is just, you know, always good. So, at any rate, there, um, the devotee understands Krishna's purpose and understands that sometimes one might be put in distress, one sometimes might be put in happiness, and it is ultimately for our own good. Um, very, very wonderful verse, uh, 10, 14, 8 in Lord Brahma's prayers. And of course, very well known verse, Tate Nukampam Sushamikshamano, where Lord Brahma prays, My dear Lord, 
one who earnestly waits for you to bestow your causeless mercy upon him, all the while patiently suffering the reactions of his past misdeeds and offering you respectful obeisances within his heart, words, and body, is surely eligible for liberation, for it has become his rightful claim. So Lord Brahma is expressing the condition, our condition, the position of the conditioned soul, that one uh, will experience suffering from the reaction to past misdeeds, but he earnestly waits for the Lord's causeless mercy and understands that. In the uh, purport, Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur comments, a devotee understands that the happiness and distress he undergoes due to performing bhakti and committing aparads are special mercy from the Lord. It is like the father who sometimes makes his child drink milk and sometimes makes him drink neem juice. Sometimes the father embraces and kisses his son and sometimes he beats him. The devotee accepts whatever happens to him as the arrangement of the Lord acting for his benefit. The devotee thinks, the Lord certainly knows what is best for me, even if I don't know. Karma and time have no effect on a devotee, so this is Krishna's personal arrangement for me. Out of his mercy, Krishna sometimes gives me happiness and sometimes gives me distress, considering how to engage me in his service. So this is a very, very nice analogy that Vishwanath gives about the relationship between a parent and a child. So sometimes the parent will give the, give the child some sweets or milk or something very nice, and the child very much appreciates that care and that love from the parent. Sometimes if the child is sick, this reference to bitter neem juice, of course, is medicinal. You know, back in the old days, actually even before my generation, they used to use castor oil or something. That was something that tasted very obnoxious, you know, but it was really terrible, but it was good for you. It was supposedly good for you. I don't know what it exactly cured, but, you know, that was the idea that sometimes medicine may not be pleasant to taste. So the child may not appreciate that. The child may think, why is my mother or my father making me taste, take this awful tasting medicine? But the parent, in both cases, loves the child equally. And in both cases, the parent is doing what is best for the child. The parent is giving the medicine because the child must have it to get better. So even though the child may not appreciate it, it is purely in the child's best interest. And this is the same way that Krishna acts with us. Krishna sometimes gives us the sweets and sometimes the bitter medicine. And just like that child who may not understand or appreciate that the parent is doing this out of love, we may not also always understand and appreciate Krishna's activity and how he treats us and the good and the bad that we ex tend to experience. But the devotee has faith that Krishna is always acting for their good. It is for their benefit. So this is a, this is a very important concept that we, there it is that we need to try to understand. My own experience is that when we do experience suffering or distress, the reasons and the lessons may not always be apparent. Isn't that true? Sometimes we don't always know. We think, why is this happening to me? And then you may have also experienced it maybe sometime later, maybe a few days later, maybe a few years later, it sort of becomes clear. You understand why that happened. And that's very interesting. Uh, some of you may know um, Mother Archana City lives in North Carolina. She writes articles a lot for the Back to Godhead magazine, and she's a, she's a, a, a licensed counselor as well. And she's writing a book now. She's been going around getting interviews. And it's something, the title is something like, When, good, when Bad is Good. And, you know, and, she's, and she's putting together all of these incidents where devotees had something happen to them that was very difficult or put them in great distress. And later, they realized, they, had, they discovered how this was actually beneficial, or they gained some great lesson. You know? And I, I mean, I can even see in my own, own life, I mean, some of the, some of the experience which seemed negative, um, you know, were actually, were actually great lessons. You know, I, about four years ago, I had cancer, and 
it's fine now. But um, I think it was one of the greatest learning lessons I had. I actually felt very grateful afterwards that Krishna had given, you know, given me that opportunity because it made me realize I actually am not immortal. <laughs> you know, this body may die. I have to become serious, you know, because we have a limited time here in Krishna consciousness. You know, so these are the, these are kind of, of course, it was only a little token, it, you know, obviously I, it, didn't, it didn't kill me, you know. But even if it had, you know, there would have been some, you know, it would have still been somehow Krishna working for what was best for me. So this is the sort of the faith that we need to have as devotees, that whatever, whatever is happening is ultimately going to be for a benefit. And so, you know, if we think about those situations in our life, probably the worst, I, I do a lot of counseling with devotees, and I find that one of the things that's least helpful when devotees externalize blame or project, you know, uh, other people are the cause of their problems, they may be, it may actually be true, you may be justified, you may be absolutely right, but it doesn't help you a lot. You know, it's because Krishna is working with us and even working in our relationship and association with devotees. I used to always say that the association of devotees is our greatest gift and it's our greatest challenge. You know, sometimes it, it can seem very difficult because Krishna works in that way. Krishna works through the devotees uh, in ways that may challenge us in ways that we have to surrender, that we have lessons to learn, that we need to improve different aspects of our devotional service. So we need to be looking for those lessons. Um, the lessons don't, aren't of much value if we don't learn from them. And they're coming all the time, isn't, aren't they? I mean, Krishna is constantly speaking to us. Krishna is constantly showing us and giving us opportunities to advance in Krishna consciousness. It's really a question of whether we're listening whether we want to hear that. Krishna is actually instructing us through our God brothers and God sisters or, or just through everyday incidents of life or through the scriptures or every time we open up the Bhagavad Gita or Srimad Bhagavatam, there's probably a potential lesson for us, but we have to be very alert to those and be willing to hear them. Sometimes we're not so willing to hear the lessons because what are we talking about what Krishna is trying to do? He's trying to get us to surrender. And surrender is difficult, isn't it? At least it is for me. You know, it's, 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 a, it's not such an easy process. Uh, we describe it as a very easy process because it is. All we have to do is chant Hare Krishna, chant Hare Krishna and be happy. That part of it is easy. But if we want to really make deeper advancement, then sooner or later there's some real surrendering that we have to do. And we have to kind of be ready for that and expect that. Although it's also described sometimes that Krishna will not give us tests that are greater than we can handle. Generally, he is very personally dealing with every one of us in such a way, you know, that we can deal with those tests or those things that come up, those, uh, those issues, problems, suffering, whatever it may be. Krishna is delivering in such a way that we will be able to make advancement in Krishna consciousness, you know. So uh, I also wanted to mention there is, there is another reason why devotees sometimes suffer, and that's because of uh, Vishwanath mentioned in the purport through uh, because of offenses, aparad. Now that's an entirely new, different class that would take you know, another hour, so I'm not going to go you know, too far into that. But we, but we can understand that, um, that that is also an issue of why we sometimes experience suffering. Um, and uh, there's a purport in Bhakti Vishnamari Sintu 121, uh, Vishnu's commentary says, in spite of the fact that bhava or rati has appeared, so we're even talking about a very advanced level, the obstacles have not been completely dissipated. There still remains a trace of some serious aparad because the effects of aparad are very strong and long lasting. And they, in this condition, with even a trace of apara that generates suffering, such a bhakti perfectional state cannot appear. So that's another reason we may sometimes experience some distress just due to our aparads, and particularly Vaishnava aparad being the most uh, important. So kind of to summarize, the devotees, uh, as far as I can see from the different scriptures and, and from our acharyas, 
there's three or maybe four reasons why devotees who are even becoming freed from all distress, becoming freed from all of our past reaction, are still experiencing suffering in this lifetime. First is because there are still residual reactions to our past sinful activities, although we must understand that it is not like ordinary karma, it is handled directly. Second, Krishna will often put devotees in difficulty deliberately for their own good or for their surrender or for their learning. And I think a subset of that is sometimes Krishna puts devotees in difficulty for others' learning. In other words, Prahlad Maharaj is a pure devotee. He doesn't have to suffer from, you know, at the hands of Hiranyakasipu so that he can learn to surrender, but it's for our benefit. So we can learn how to surrender by seeing the wonderful, glorious example of a Mahajan like, like uh, Prahlad Maharaj. So either for our, own, for our own learning or for part of Krishna's pastimes of teaching others, uh, there may be some apparent suffering for the devotees. And the third reason, of course, is for, because of offenses, uh, or Vaishnava Apara, that we may experience this. So the position of the devotee is that we should try to understand these things, and especially as they, as they are happening to us personally. And the best way of dealing with these is through trying to develop our faith. Krishna is working to help us. We know that Krishna will protect us. He will care for us. Ultimately, every, usually the distress, well, first of all, we know the distress that we experience is either to our body or our mind, right? It's not, it's not the spirit's soul. You know, my, who I am, a servant of Krishna, a servant of my spiritual master, that is not suffering. But suffering is either my body is suffering or my mind is suffering. And in Kali Yuga, it's often our mind, isn't it? Yeah, I, I was giving a class on this the other day, and I, I was looking up some um, figures or some research and realizing the amount of mental distress that people experience in Kali Yuga. It's amazing. And uh, I was reading some statistics on college students. Like 50 or 60% of them are practically clinically depressed, you know, are feeling totally overwhelmed, you know, by everything. And I mean, young people who are at the peak of their life and their enjoyment, and they've got their world ahead of them, and should be in this very, very materially happy state of life, are completely miserable. I mean, there's actually, uh, actually National Institute of Health research on this. This isn't just a throwing out a Bhagavatam class, a hyperbole, how everyone's suffering. Everyone is suffering, and there's facts and research that you can find that show how people are truly suffering in this material world. I was also looking up the, of, the, uh, of the 10 top uh, prescription drugs in the United States, six or seven of them are for either anxiety or depression or, or some type of mental disturbance. So, I mean, this is, people are not very happy. There's a, there's a, there's a great deal of distress that is experienced. So even though like we're curing different diseases and people have this idea that science is helping us to advance and it's going to make us happy and we won't have to suffer because of all of these wonderful advancements of science, the fact is we're suffering even more. We're suffering more distress than ever. What to speak of the distress that human beings inflict upon one another? Isn't there like a new place in the world practically every week where a war is breaking out or someone is you know, exterminating another group or something. You know, it's like, I just saw in the paper that, what was it, some suicide bomber that killed hundreds, you know, dozens of people in Moscow. And I mean, it's just constant. It's, it's not even anything, you know, I look at a headline like that now and I'm practically immune to it. You know, I practically don't even react because it's daily. It's the daily condition of the world. So all the suffering is going on for everybody. That's another thing. It's not that, oh, I'm suffering and other people are not. I mean, sometimes, sometimes devotees actually will think this. Somehow, and they, they actually get angry at Krishna. Like, Krishna's put me in some sort of situation some uh, of suffering. Now, everyone is suffering. Being in the material world means suffering. That's another point. You know, but Krishna is kindly minimizing that suffering, and whatever suffering he has given to me is for my benefit, and that's what we need to have that faith that Lord Brahma has. When he said he earnestly waits to for Krishna to bestow his causes mercy upon him, and he patiently suffering the reactions of his past misdeeds, all the time worshiping Krishna. So our faith needs to be that we continue our devotional service, that we 
that we understand our position in this material world. And if we actually thought, if we actually had that faith of Lord Brahma and what that would mean, what that would mean for us to, understand, you know, to, act, to actually have that kind of faith, the kind of advancement that we could make. So what separates us from pure devotional service is really that lack of faith in spiritual life and, the, and that we maintain our faith in material happiness. We still think there may be some happiness we can have in this material world. We all think that. I think that, you know, that somehow or another we're thinking, yeah, but there's still something that I kind of enjoy this and I could enjoy this and maybe in the future if I get this together I could enjoy that too. You know, and so our faith is still a little bit misdirected, although we're trying. We're, we're in the right situation, we're, you know, we're, we're rightly situated, as they say. So we need to build that faith in Krishna. And build that faith that Krishna is our only shelter and only through devotional service are we going to find the happiness that we're looking for. So where does that faith come from? Well, one of the most important things is from the association of devotees. We know that in the beginning there, has, there must be shraddha, it's described faith. And the next step is sadhusanga. The association of devotees, and particularly association with the pure devotees, making a connection with the spiritual master. Then that faith in a relationship with uh, and connection with the association of devotees is nourished by the next step, bhajana kriya, by the process of hearing and chanting. The process of sadhana bhakti strengthens that faith. Right? And then, anartha nirvriti, all those past misgivings, those past, those anartas within the heart, all of that is starting to give up till we, till we reach the stage of nishta or steadiness. You know, that's when faith becomes steady. We can actually see the, nine, uh, the different processes and stage of devotional service is, is also being stages of faith development, different ways that, our, the ways that our faith develops gradually through the different processes so that one who's at the stage of bhava or prema has complete faith total faith in Krishna at all times. Okay. So, even if that faith is not completely pure, even if we are not completely pure, we still need to value the devotees that we are, as devotees that we continue to serve in that mood of faith. So, that should be a goal. In other words, that's our aspirational goal, is to try to attain that. Even if we're not pure, even if we still have material desires, even if that faith in material enjoyment may still be there within the heart, we do at least know the goal. And if we continue to value that goal, then we'll be rightly situated. And Krishna will give us all help. In the, I'll end with uh, another nice verse from the Srimad Bhagavatam, 11, 20, 27, and 28. This is directly from Krishna speaking. Krishna says, if my computer comes back on, Krishna says, having awakened faith in the narrations of my glories, being disgusted with all material activities, knowing that all sense gratification leads to misery, but still being unable to renounce all sense enjoyment, my devotee should remain happy and worship me with great faith and conviction. Even though he is sometimes engaged in sense enjoyment, my devotee knows that all sense gratification leads to a material result, and he sincerely repents such activities. I've always found this a very hopeful verse, a very encouraging verse, because Krishna is understanding the plight of the conditioned soul in the material world. Krishna knows it's difficult for us. So he's recognizing that the devotee may not be able to renounce all sense enjoyment, but is still offering that hope that if we continue to happily engage in Krishna consciousness, continue to worship Krishna with great faith and conviction, then eventually the goal will be attained. Yeah. So uh, we simply need to persevere, try to uh, meditate upon uh, how Krishna is working in our life, how we can develop and deepen our faith and uh, continue to engage in this process of surrendering to Krishna. Okay, so I'll stop at that point and I'm sure that some of the devotees have deeper realizations. I do, Prabhu. We'll start over here. Go over here first. Yeah. Yeah. 
Thank you, Peru. Uh, Sorry. In the purport, in the purport to the Tate Nukampam verse, it's explained that just as a, what does a, um, a son of a rich man have to do to inherit his father's property is that he just has to stay alive. Yeah. And then That's his father true. dies. And yeah. 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 <laughs> so my question then is, especially from the youth point of view, what do I have um, to, as far as staying alive, offering service to the society? Um, but at the same time, sometimes I see, well, the seniors are still in these different positions. Mm -hmm. So do I wait till they die and then inherit that? <laughs> what, how, do I, how do I become enthusiastic to help mm -hmm. towards moving the society? Of course, the example of that verse is the inheritance that we all, that we all experience of, of being able to re go to the spiritual world. And that, of course, is equal despite, and that has nothing really to do with position particularly. But your question is also very good and, and brings up some interesting points. And, you know, in fact, these will be some of, uh, I think we'll be touching on some of these topics in some panel discussions during our Temple Presidents meeting, um, you know, which is um, involved with um, succession of how we continue on and how new leadership is brought into our movement. In fact, uh, it's a very important question to me. Anuta Prabhu and myself are involved in the uh, GBC Leadership and Succession Committee. And so we've been kind of struggling with those ideas, you know, a lot. And, um, and it is a very, very good question. And um, I wish we had all the answers. But uh, the one thing that I will say is this, that um, there's a great need for leadership in our movement. There's a great need for people to step up. At any given time uh, in North America, there's probably, how many Temple Presidents uh, openings do we have in New Temple? Would you say at any given time? Three, four probably, or? You are gonna say 10, okay. <laughs> wow, yeah, but in, in other words, but not just Temple Presidents, but everything, you know, uh, preachers, uh, anybody, you know, any, ty any type of service. There, there's a great need for service. And I think that most of us recognize that our time is getting limited. Uh, and we're, at, you know, most of us are really looking for finding those young people who can step up. And, and, uh, and I think it's just a question of just serving and that service will be recognized by the Vaishnavs. And, and also it doesn't, it doesn't hurt to let people know, uh, you know, I'm, I have this desire, you know, I am available, you know, and, and uh, probably someone will grab you real quick. <laughs> I mean, you're already doing nice service, you know. And yes, and they tell me. You know, you think when, when Prabhupada was physically here, I mean, it wasn't like everybody that joined the first temple in New York became, you know, quote unquote, an authority in New York. It was like, okay, well, you go to Phoenix. Okay, you go to Germany. Okay, you go to Korea. Etc. He just he was very much pioneering, and organizationally speaking, any organization that's either stagnant or shrinking, the people coming up through the ranks, there's no place to go. Yeah. But if you're expanding, then there's unlimited opportunities for more people, and you know, the person that's been there a day takes on a project, and he's been there five days, he has to move up because the guy above him just got transferred someplace, and the woman above him just got transferred someplace. So part of us, I think, ourselves. <clears throat> I remember when I was a temple president in Denver, I had experiences. Some people would come in and say, you need to do this. You know, like, you need to get Harinam going five days a week because two days is Maya and this and that. And, you know, I'd listen to them and tell them thank you very much, and, and then they'd leave. And I would ask them, well, maybe you could help, and they'd say, no, you need to do it. But then there are, there are other people come in and say, you know, I've got an idea <clears throat> that, me, that maybe we should do this and this and this. And I would often say, well, that, that sounds like it could be a very good idea. Why don't you think about it for a couple of days and come back with a plan how it can be achieved. Eight out of 10 times, they never come back. Yeah. But the two times when they came back, I knew, wow, here's somebody I can really help. And, and you know, and they come back and they say, well, look, I already got it figured out because we just need a van and so-and-so's going to loan a van and this and that. And then my whole question was, how can I help you achieve that? Are there any obstacles I can get out of the way? So I think that's something that we all can think 
Because yeah. there's so much can be done. It doesn't mean we all got to be rebels and radicals and step outside the boundaries of whatever our community's vision is. But to help expand that vision by saying, you know, I'm already doing 35, 40 hours of service on the altar. But I was thinking maybe I could help do a college program on Tuesday night and um, et cetera. Mm. And then, and then it grows. And the next thing you know, you're in charge of the college program that's going to 15 different colleges. The next thing you know, I mean, things do work like that. So part of it is we have to take initiative and, and not see things within a limited boundary. <clears throat> you know, like, you know, Prince Charles may live to be 106 before his mother dies, but hopefully he's still trying to do a few other things for the sake of the kingdom. I think there was, there was a question here and then... Me, Prabhu, did he, he, I think he was next. Thank you so much for the wonderful class, Prabhu. The, um, my question was about the point of surrender. You were talking about surrendering, and surrender seems to be a concept of that once you've done it, you're in a surrendered position, and then, but when you start talking about it practically, it seems to be a, like a, a, an ongoing mm -hmm. activity. You know, it's not really a position, but rather it's an ongoing service. And um, so that, w that was my question. We're kind of touching on it here. But again, um, I, I was hoping you could elaborate a little bit, please. Well, I think uh, what you just expressed is a very, very nice realization. And uh, you said it very well, that uh, surrendering isn't like a one-time thing. Okay, I surrendered. That's done. Check that off. What's next? You know, surrendering is a lifetime process. It's a process, maybe, maybe a multi-lifetime process, you know, until we finally reach that goal. Although I, I think we could say that um, we've done one of the major milestones in the surrendering process by becoming devotees, obviously, in all the lifetimes and all the different species of life. And, you know, in other words, it's very rare that someone comes to the point and become, yes, I am, I'm surrendered to you, Krishna. I want to be your devotee. So obviously that's very significant. But as you said, it doesn't stop there. Then it's, then it's uh, you know, it, it's the constant lessons. It's the little by little surrendering, you know, through, throughout our life. And, um, and I think what we'll find is that uh, the more sincere we, I don't know if even the more sincere we are, but somehow or another Krishna gives us those opportunities. Krishna always presents opportunities to surrender. We'll find that. And, and, um, and if we take those opportunities, he'll probably give us more opportunities to surrender. So... So that's there. I mean, that, that's going to be going on. And as you said, it is kind of an ongoing choice. It's a day-to-day -day decision. It's a moment-to-moment -moment decision. And um, sometimes it almost seems overwhelming, you know, like, uh, because it's, as even Lord Brahma says, and even as Lord Krishna is saying in the Bhagavatam, it is difficult. It doesn't always happen immediately. Uh, I've, I've found for myself that one of the things that helps me the most is, is actually prayer. You know, just... You know, just pray a lot to Krishna. I may not be very surrendered, but please help me to surrender. Try to help me with the situation. You know, in other words, just kind of being in that mood of trying to turn to Krishna. You know, and realize I'm not very surrendered. I'm not very strong. I'm not very capable as a devotee. But you are. You know, and Prabhupada, you are. You, have, you, know, you can also empower me. Or you can help me, you know, to maybe accomplish a little bit or achieve a little bit, you know through your mercy. Did, did you have anything else you wanted to say on it? Or maybe? That was wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. I find sometimes people ask questions, actually it's something they've thought about and have a lot of realization themselves about it, you know, which, which you have, it looks, sounds like. Okay, we had one over here. Hare Krishna. Um, not so much a question as an expansion of the discussion that was being held mm -hmm. uh, prior. Um, and also an observation, uh, there's two kinds of service. There's motivational and dev uh, devotional service. I'm sorry, say it again. There's motivational service and devotional service. Okay. <laughs> uh, but prior to the um, discussion about uh, involving the youth, um, instead of just waiting for somebody else to die, um, it's not part of the bucket list. Um, what we just did in Toronto is expand the uh, management structure and included two of the uh, strongest leaders in the youth groups, uh, one very strong in book distribution. Um, just in December, they distributed over 7,000 Bhagavad Gita's. And um, the other one is in PR, Rathayatra, and fundraising activities of that nature. 
we've asked them to uh, participate at council and management level. And after some consideration, they accepted. And that's already changed the atmosphere, not only bring in new blood, but um, uh, cause a change in the way people view council and management structure as just you know a group of old fogies just sitting on an ivory tower dictating how things should be to a, a very active, proactive principle. Uh, and that's already made a significant impact. That, that's a wonderful example. And I, I've heard a lot about Toronto, and Perharn has told us a lot about yeah. how the... <laughs> You know, You'll she, hear more. <laughs> she's she's very enthusiastic, as you know, one of the real promoters of how, you know, of how the the youth have been so involved and have really uh, have transformed Toronto, yeah. and and we see that many places, I, I think. And and I, I agree. I I didn't mean to imply that you know just work hard and your day will come. I think we have to, you know, the leaders have to be proactive. That's yeah. so like and in Alachua, we have we have two youth on our board of directors. You know, in other words, we can do things to proactively yeah. and, and bring they, youth uh, in, engage. And in fact, you know, we just, I don't, was, I don't know if anybody here came to the 24-hour kirtan we had in Halachua uh, over uh, Thanksgiving, but it was wonderful. We had like 500 devotees there. We had these big name, you know, uh, great kirtan leaders from all over the world came and great success. We're going to really expand it. We're going to do it every year. It's part of our whole, the youth completely did it. Yeah. Our, our second generation organized it, fundraised for it put on the whole thing. I mean, it was, it was, it was great. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're enlivened and, you know, and then, but, you know, and it's done in such a nice way. I mean, they said, this is, you know, they came to the temple manager, said, this is what we're going to do, what we want to do. And we said, great, go for it. You know, yeah. I mean, we just stepped back, got out of their way, you know, let, let them do it. You know, but now we're going to continue to work also in ways that we can, um, we can help. They, you know, they can help in them and we can help, you know, and really work together. And there's just so many opportunities like this. And uh, it you is know, it opens the, one, up. The, one, the one thing that, uh, you know, mm -hmm. us old fogies sitting up in our ivory towers, um, uh, we may have a little experience, but we don't really quite have the energy we used to. And, and I think that that, that uh, energy the youth has is just is wonderful. And it just tell, it's really what's going to drive things forward. Yeah. And... Um, you know, when they ask questions, they're usually very probing. Mm -hmm. And that certainly livens up the heartbeat. <laughs> <laughs> so it's very good. Yeah. Like okay. I don't know. I, we're probably supposed to end class about now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.